Thanks, uh, Professor Pondrangan. Actually, thanks for putting this together. It's a wonderful, uh, you know, it's a wonderful venue. It's a wonderful program. Uh, wonderful people. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and uh, though I should uh, give a disclaimer about um, you know the topic to make it quite evident, I put the blockchains in uh, in brackets here. So this is just going to be some introductory material on cryptography in general. They can be used in blockchains. Some of them things are. Some of them could be in the future. Some of them, you know, may need modifications before you can use them in uh, such um, uh, in in the blockchain kind of setting. But what um, you know, what I would think of blockchain as. So we don't have a definition of blockchain. There's one thing called blockchain. For me, blockchain is just a place for a lot of people to come together and work, I mean, and use some resources, and they they don't trust each other. It's a, you know, a distrustful world, and that's precisely what cryptography tries to do, to enable collaboration between people who don't trust each other. Okay, so without, um, you know, kind of uh, much ado, let me jump into the things I'm trying to cover. There's a lot of bullet points here, and they're not even, uh, enough to cover uh, all the interesting things that could be used in blockchains. This is a random assortment of topics, but I think it will give you the flavor of uh, uh, kind of things you could do with cryptography. So what I'll do is initially I'll start with a few things that you think of as cryptography if you're coming from outside the theoretical cryptography literature. Right? If you're a practitioner, if you use uh, it for security, these are the kind of tools you would uh, use there for secure communication. And then what I'll do in the rest of this talk and also tomorrow's talk is go on to talk about other fancier cryptographic tools that can be actually used for collaborative computation, not just communication, okay? So it doesn't matter what the uh, list of things are. Let me just start with um, the first one here, hash functions, because they are probably the things that you, know, you would have seen the most in um, anything like a bit in any of these blockchains. Okay. And I won't uh, make the connections to blockchains all the time. I'll just go ahead and tell you what these tools are and try to finish within time. So hash function, what is a hash function? Uh, at some level, it's, a, it's an efficiently computable function, calling it H. And it takes strings, arbitrary long strings, and it gives you some short fixed length strings, short as in say 256 bits or something around that. Um, so that's what in practice a hash function is. What do you need from this uh, function? This most typical or most um, you know, central uh, guarantee people look for from hash function is what's called collision resistance. Um, so base, what does collision resistance mean? means it should be infeasible for an adversary to find two strings that are mapped to the same output string, okay? Um, now, this already puts some constraints on how short uh, the output can be. If the output is too short, just by picking random input strings, you would find a collision uh, at some point, and it's called the birthday attack, if you, uh, you know, have heard of that. So, you know, that's why something like 256 bits is uh, good. But of course, that's, you know, just being long enough is not good enough. It also has to have some computational hardness uh, uh, property associated with it that could give you collision resistance. But it's not just collision resistance, uh, especially in the way it's used in blockchains. There are several other properties people attribute to a hash function. Um, so they roughly uh, go in the lines of saying that if, you know, for any input, the output should look random. I put it in quotes because it's not a formal in, in not in a formal sense, right? Output, it's not random really, it's one particular, you take a particular string, you compute it, you get some particular output string. There's nothing random about it, it's a deterministic process, but you know, you're hoping that there is some notion of every string has been assigned outputs randomly. Okay. Um, so that's, I'll leave it at, as an informal guarantee, um, but uh, you know, there are other questions you could ask so you shouldn't be able to find an input-output pair. You can always find an input-output pair by computing the function. Take an input, compute it, and you get the corresponding output. Uh, but in, we'd like to say that that's the best, that's the most efficient way to find an input-output pair. There's no easier way to find um, 
you know, inputs except by evaluating the hash function. Okay, uh, input output pairs except by evaluating the hash function. So th this again is a little bit of a vague guarantee, right? Maybe you don't evaluate the hash function exactly as written uh, in the standards. You have some other program which effectively does the same thing. Does that mean you computed the hash function or, you know, uh, or maybe you can speed it up a little bit. Is that a problem? Well, all these kind of vague guarantees as well as many other concrete guarantees are all absorbed into a formal model called the random oracle model. Uh, it's a heuristic model. So with the random oracle model, uh, more, you know, in, in, in this framework, you model hash function as something that has been picked randomly from all possible functions that map strings to uh, fixed length outputs. And one of those functions has been picked and kept uh, in the sky for everyone to use. But the only way they can use this uh, and access this oracle is actually by querying the oracle. Then you, know, you make a query, you get the output. This is, of course, not how it works, right? You have the description of the hash function as a little program. If it were a truly random function, it won't fit into a small program. Uh, so it's clearly a wrong uh, assumption. So it's, so it's a heuristic model, but it's a very effective heuristic model. And much of what's done today in the blockchain uh, world, you know, fr freely uh, uses the random oracle model. So I'll not worry about, in, in theory, we have a lot of criticism about the random oracle model. We know that you can instantiate things, you can, you can build, uh, you know, kind of magical objects which simply don't exist. But if you assume you're given a random oracle, you can build them. So, you know, uh, there are issues with the random oracle model. You should be careful in uh, how you use it. But by and large, it's, uh, uh, you know, if you use it conservatively, it, uh, oh, it's acceptable, or people are, people are not found a real attack on it. Uh, one way to interpret the random oracle model is to say that if somebody finds an attack, um, and to find an attack on your scheme, that is, if your scheme has already been proven secure in the random oracle model, but somebody finds an attack on your scheme, that's because they have figured out something about the hash function. They have figured out some, you know, uh, structure in the hash function, something that they can exploit computationally. So if you assume your adversary is not the most sophisticated cryptanalyst, then you don't worry about this. They, don't, they are going to use a black, um, hash function as a black box, so they won't come across this attack which uses the hash function's internal structure in some clever way. Yeah, so by and large, people are happy to live with uh, the random oracle model, and we'll um, keep referring to this in the rest of the lecture. OK. So with hash functions, the first uh, non-trivial thing you can start doing is what's called a Merkle tree. So Merkle tree was proposed by Merkle in, way back in 79. And so, so this was kind of the early days of cryptography, uh, public key cryptography. Um, you know, public key encryption had been just discovered, public key signatures, RSA was just uh, discovered. And Merkle came up with his own signature scheme. And, um, you know, at that time he thought it's probably a better idea to patent it. Uh, so he patented it. That's probably why we have not heard a lot about um, his scheme. But in that scheme, he used a, a, a construction which is, you know, which has a lot of. Uh, uh, currency, and that's Merkle trees. So what's a Merkle tree? You could think of it as a, a general technique for domain extension of hash functions. Domain extension means you build a hash function which has a small, a certain domain, so maybe it works on you know, strings of length, say, 1024, and now you want to extend the domain of that hash function so that it can work on strings of arbitrary length. Okay? So, uh, so suppose you have built this hash function which takes, uh, which Hash function, you know, the, for collision resistance, the non-triviality is because the hash function is compressing. So suppose you have built such a hash function which takes two n-bit strings and maps them to n-bit strings, okay? But its domain is fixed. It can only take two n-bit long strings for some particular n. Um, and you, you could change, you know, use that uh, hash function and make it a hash function that takes arbitrary long strings. Here is one way. Let's say for, now forget arbitrary long. So each block here is n bits. And, you know, say you want to make a hash function that takes eight n bits. 
and gives you n bits. So you originally hash function which takes two n bits, or let me call it takes two blocks of data and gives you one block as output. You want now a new hash function which can work on eight block data, the eight block long data, right? And here is what you could do. You just put your two blocks into the hash function, get one block. Take the next two blocks, put it through the hash function, get, get another block and so forth. So you can reduce these eight blocks into four blocks and keep repeating until you get just one block, okay? So that's the structure of a Merkle tree. It doesn't have to be a fully balanced tree, but that's when you, know, you get the uh, best uh, parameters for certain things. Um, but for many purposes, for just, if you're, if you're working sequentially anyway, can be any tree, doesn't have to be a binary tree. Here it's binary because you're going from 2n to n. Okay. Um, so that's what a hash function, a Merkle tree construction looks like. Now, if you want to actually get a, so this is a new hash function you got which works on 8 bit blocks. If you want something which actually works on arbitrary long strings, you need to also make sure there are no, it's not open to what's called a length extension attack. So you encode the length, say here in this case, 8. You encode that as another little block of data and hash that also. So that, that prevents somebody from uh, pretending that, you know, uh, to coming up with a, um, another thing which is uh, um, a longer string which has the same, which has a collision. So I, w I won't, you know, don't worry about it. The, the, it needs a proof that this w makes it work, not too hard, but it makes it work, okay? And here, uh, actually collision resistant, so this new hash function is collision resistant if the original one is collision resistant. You don't need anything like a random oracle model, okay? Um, you can work in a much more, um, you know, uh, cryptographically clean model uh, uh, and, uh, you know, um, still make this work. And it even works for weaker notions of collision resistance. There is something called universal one-way hash functions. Uh, though there you would require picking a different hash function at each level. But if it's uh, true collision resistance, um, as I had in the previous slide, you don't need to, in the same hash function, I mean, it's, it's just one hash function that you picked, and that's the one you pick, put everywhere. Okay. Um, okay, so this preserves collision resistance. That's the main, main property. And you might say, why do we need it? Already there are standards out there which can take arbitrary long strings and give you a short string, but many of those standards internally use this. So this is how they manage to take arbitrary long strings and give you a short hash function by first uh, building these compression functions and then putting it together in a Merkle tree. All right, so Merkle tree is a really useful thing that you know, gets used practically in secure communication, internal to these things. Um, but it also is something that gets used um, explicitly, somewhat explicitly in a, in a Merkle tree, in a blockchain. But in a blockchain, it gets used in a rather, um, um, you could say, a simplified way. The tree, the tree is actually just a chain. Okay? And um, your genesis block, the first block, the, you know, uh, the present one is talking about, the zeroth block, is just one of these leaves here. And then when you add, you add to the you know, add to the other end of the tree, uh, to the chain. So you add a new block to the other end of the chain and you would hash whatever came out of the, so you would have a new hash corresponding to the longer chain, which is obtained by hashing what came out of the previous uh, tree, previous chain, and the new block together, and that's a hash of the longer chain. Okay, that's, so that's something that already blockchains are doing. And blockchains, you don't really need the length because you explicitly assume that everybody knows what the genesis block is, so you don't need to keep um, including the length of the blockchain into what you're chaining. So the, uh, yeah, so the new block gets added at the root. Uh, maybe I should mention, so the guarantee you're getting from using this Merkle tree in a blockchain is that somebody who knows the hash or the, or the last block which internally has the hash uh, of the Merkle of the whole chain and the genesis block, the first block, cannot be fooled into accepting another uh, uh, explanation of the block blockchain, right? You, the, 
under assuming collision resistance holds, there's only one explanation any, anybody can come up with for how the final hash was derived from starting with the genesis block. So all these blocks, there's only one explanation you can give uh, in getting your uh, uh, final, uh, 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 the current block. Okay? So that's the way blockchain is getting used, or Merkle tree is getting used in a blockchain to preserve the integrity of the blockchain in some sense. But there is another very useful property of a Merkle tree, which you know, subsequently exploited. Merkle didn't need it for his signatures, but it was subsequently exploited in many uh, works in things like zero knowledge proofs, which I'll talk about, you'll hear about later also. Um, and that's the following. You can, it's not just, some, suppose somebody has uh, hashed a long string uh, into a short uh, block using a Merkle tree. And now I want to prove to you that, uh, you know, this long, this long string in the i-th block, say the sixth block, has a particular value, z, okay? How do I prove to you? Well, I mean, I could show you this entire eight blocks. You can hash it yourself and make sure the, so you are holding the y, and you don't know the actual input. I can give you the actual input, and you can verify that this input indeed gives you that y. And you can also verify that, you know, all I want to, Suppose all I want to convince you is that the sixth block has this value z. Then I don't, you know, yeah, so you can verify to yourself if I give you the entire uh, string under eight blocks. But I don't need to give you the entire eight blocks, maybe, right? All I care about is convincing you that the sixth block has this value. Then do I need to give you the entire eight blocks? And Merkle tree gives you a way not to uh, do that, not to have to, you know, give the whole thing. Here is how a proof using a Merkle tree would look like. Uh, so I will only expose to you these. Um, so I, I draw the path from the root to the, my sixth block. And hanging off that path are these little nodes, right? So, so there's some value in these, each of these edges, there is some hash value. So I give you all those orange hash values. And I'll also give you the value z, z okay? And then that's enough for you to compute the uh, final block, uh, the, the final hash, y. And under the assumption of a collision resistance, there was no two ways I could have explained this. So if I can, I give you one explanation of what the sixth block is, that's the only explanation I'll be able to give you, unless I can find a collision in the hash function. So this, um, yeah, so the collision resistance gives you a soundness guarantee for this little proof. And what did we save? Imagine the string is very long, then all I'm, instead of giving you all, say, n blocks here, I'm giving you only log n blocks, log n hashes. Okay? So it's a much more succinct proof, uh, which lets me selectively prove things to you in the hash, in the, about the input that has been hashed. It also has a nice kind of secrecy property. Maybe all these blocks are things I don't want you to see anyway. So then I'm only giving you hashes of those values. And if you think of this as a random oracle, those hashes are just random strings anyway. Right? So this has a nice secrecy property also. But in particular, it has a, in addition, it has a, an efficiency property. Okay? So does that make sense? So this is a way to give proofs using a Merkle tree of some very specific uh, kind, about, uh, 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 proof of a very particular kind of claim about the string that has been hashed without having to give you the entire string. Okay. All right, so um, I think that's all I wanted to tell you about hash functions. So my entire lecture is going to be like this, a bunch of you know, uh, snippets of interesting things from uh, crypto. So I'm, I'm moving on to the next thing, uh, which also uh, is a you know, uh, the, the order in which I'm putting these first two things at least is because they are two things that get used in blockchains. So the other thing that gets used in blockchains are digital signatures. So what's a digital signature? So you know, even before blockchains or any of that, uh, people wanted to authenticate communication, right? And if you and I share a key, then there is a particular, you know, then it's not too hard to authenticate Encryption, you can use it. I'll talk about that in a bit, uh, maybe in the next slide. Um, that's called message authentication. 
But the challenge, the challenge that digital signatures tackles is when we don't have a shared key. Instead, we are in the public key setting where I have published a public key. So you have, you know, you can look at my public key and then you receive some message purportedly signed by me. Okay. Clearly, and, and, and you're going to verify this by comparing it with my public key. So you're going to take my public key, the signed message, and going to run a verification to check, you know, if it says yes or no. So clearly I cannot sign the message using the public key itself because that public key is out there for everyone to use. So anybody can forge my signature. If that's the key, I'm going to create the signature. So no, so that's the key everyone uses to verify a signature, but I have a private key that I created along with the public key that I'll use to create the signature, okay? So that's, uh, uh, that's what a digital signature is. So there are two keys. There is a key that is used to create the signatures of messages. So I take a message and somehow encode it. The encoding is just by appending some sort of a tag that I create uh, using my private key. And there's a different key that I've published that everyone can use to verify that this tag was indeed created using this private key uh, or using the private key corresponding to the public key. So the public key and private key are linked together. They were generated together. And you can use just the public key to verify that you know, a, a message's signature was generated using the private key associated with that public key. Okay, so in that sense, my public key essentially becomes my virtual identity. You don't really need to know me. All you can, you know, all you need to know is that, okay, there's somebody out there, maybe a bunch of people who knows, who control the secret key of, of this public key. So take a public key out there in the sky and say, okay, I have no idea who created it, but there's somebody who's controlling the private key. There's somebody who created this public key and, uh, you know, who knows this private key for this. And I can keep verifying messages posted by them. Okay, so for all practical purposes, this public key is their identity. Okay, I don't uh, need to know that you know, it's this person. I don't relate it to a real life identity. But I know that all these messages are com coming from the same virtual entity that is controlling the private key of this. Of course, if the private key gets leaked, then the virtual entity kind of gets taken over by whoever got the private key. Uh, so this is how, um, Identities work in a blockchain setting also. You don't really care about the actual physical uh, identity of people. You only care about the public keys. Public keys are the identities. You can keep a hash of the public key if you're worried about the length of the public key. So that's kind of what many blockchains do. They don't use a full public key, but just a hash of the public key. But for all practical purposes, it's the same thing. Uh, and, and I'll come back to this later, the message authentication code where both the sender and the receiver have uh, the same key. Okay, so how do you do something like digital signatures, right? There are many ways to do it. Um, and mostly, mostly I'm not going to talk about ways to do things um, in real detail. I didn't tell you how to do hash functions uh, in the previous slide. Um, well, there is, you know, so at some level it's going to be for hash functions some assumption that this complicated function is collision resistant. With digital signatures, a more structured object, you cannot just make an assumption that, oh, this thing is probably hard to forge because it's, you know, uh, what should the public key and private key be so, to justify such an assumption? Um, so you don't, you, you, so you build it using something simpler, something less structured. And that less structured object is a trapdoor function. So what's a trapdoor function? It also has a public key, private key kind of thing. So there's a public key F, and there's a private key F inverse. And this pair F and F inverse are sampled together. Okay, so F inverse is indeed a, uh, an algorithm for inverting the function F. F is a one-to-one -one function, so you can invert it. And so F inverse is also called the trapdoor key. So it's a you know, way for you to get into the um, system without uh, so it's a tra you know, there's a trap door that, and this key lets you open that trap door. Okay. We also need, uh, so I, I'll use, I'm going to assume that we have a trap door function. And in fact, if you've heard of RSA, uh, you know, from the late 70s, 
RSA is a trapdoor function. You might have heard of RSA as a public key encryption scheme. It's quite, it's not quite a public key encryption scheme by itself. You need to do something to make it an encryption scheme. What it is, is a trapdoor function. Okay, that's what, a, what the RSA function is. Um, or sometimes called the textbook RSA encryption is just a, as a trapdoor function. So we'll need this thing. And the, the other thing we need is a hash function which you model as a random oracle. And just from these two things, you can get a signature, okay? And that's pretty much what, uh, you know, RSA uh, did. Um, and what's the signature? To sign a message, first you hash the message. Hash is public, everyone knows how to hash the message. Uh, what is not, so, but what lets you create the signature and doesn't, wouldn't let others create the signature is that you are the only one who knows the trapdoor key, F inverse, okay? So you publish F as your public key. H is also part of the public key, everyone knows. Um, but what is your secret key is F inverse. So to sign a message, you take the message, hash it, and then invert it uh, using the trapdoor key. And it's easy to verify this, right? Because to verify, you can you know, imagine taking F on both sides. So you have the F of signature should be equal to H of the message. So F of the signature should be equal to H of the message, anyone can check that, and hopefully only you can come up with the inverse. That's not quite true if this, instead of hash of the message, if it is something, um, and if it is just a message, for instance, directly, or if it was even some invertible function, then somebody could create a signature on a bogus message if, if they could invert H also, okay? There's, a, there's an easy attack you can uh, think up, think up. So what we really rely on for this, for the security of this construction is that this H is a random oracle. There's only one way to evaluate this hash function, and that's by picking a message and evaluating it. You cannot, for instance, go backwards in this hash function. Okay. So I'm not going to give you any proofs or anything, but this, this is as simple as it can get. This is a you know, fully functional digital signature, assuming you're in the random oracle model. And indeed, there's something called the RSA signature used in RSA standard. And that is essentially this, okay? And they'll use some particular hash function uh, and assume that it's a random oracle. And their f is the RSA function. Okay. There are other uh, digital signatures also uh, based on, um, you know, discrete logarithm uh, kind of problems. So elliptical crypto kind of problems, but there's also very reasonable uh, digital signature. All right, so it would, um, it wouldn't be fair to introduce, you know, basic crypto tools without telling you about block ciphers. So I have a slide on block ciphers, but really they don't get used as much in blockchains as uh, the other two things, because this is about privacy. This is about encryption and, uh, you know, a standard kind of Bitcoin kind of blockchain wouldn't worry about uh, privacy. But let's see, for com communication, this is, a, this is a workhorse of, uh, you know, secure communication uh, channels. Okay, so I, I didn't just say block cipher, I also have something called PRF. So I'll start with PRF. PRF stands for a pseudo-random function. And yeah, so that's, a, that's an important primitive used in symmetric key cryptography. Symmetric key cryptography refers to the point where you and I have already established the same key, a secret key that you, know, you and I know and now we are going to talk to each other while you know the entire world is is dropping on us, okay? And we should we should be able to securely and uh, as in uh, secretly and uh, uh, you know, in an authenticated way talk to each other. So that's a symmetric key cryptography setting, and um, you know this pseudo-random function is one thing that can get you everything you want in that pro in that setting. So what's this pseudo-random function? It's a function that takes two inputs, uh, a key and an input, which think of it as a block. And it outputs another block. Okay, it doesn't have to be the same length, uh, but let's pretend they are. So it takes in a block of input, gives you a block of output, uh, and it has a key. And what is the guarantee? Suppose somebody, call her Alice, picks a key uh, for a, a key at random, uh, for the PRF, and she's holding onto this key, and Bob comes along and starts querying her um, with various blocks of inputs. 
uh, he can pick his blocks uh, whatever he wants uh, them to be. And for every block X that's queried, Alice will give him back um, the PRF evaluated on X using her key, okay? Now from Bob's point of view, all he's seeing is that he sends blocks, he's getting outputs. And if F is actually a PRF, he can't tell whether actually Alice is doing this thing with some key that she picked, or she's just making up random strings and random blocks as answers and giving them back to him, okay? So that's a guarantee of a PRF, that Bob can't tell whether Alice is actually using this function f with her key, or she is just making up random strings and giving them to you. Okay? If you ask the same query, of course, you will answer the same way, let's say. Um, so otherwise, she is picking them randomly. And I'll, Bob cannot tell the difference. If that's the case, then we say f is a pseudo-random function. Uh, how do you use it? Why is it useful in encryption? Okay, so to, well, you use it encryption and for this uh, symmetric key setting um, authentication. So how, let's say the message, let's think of the message as one block messages for now. Then to encrypt, your encryption scheme looks as simple as this. You pick a, so the encrypting party, now, you know, uh, both, if there are two parties, Alice and Bob, encryption and decryption, both will use, will need to know the key K, so there's a K that's already fixed. And the sender picks a random block, nothing to do with the message. Every time he wants to encrypt, he will pick a new random block each time. Uh, even if it's the same message, he's encrypting again and again. He picks a random block, and he XORs the message with the output of the pseudo-random function. So essentially, this looks like a random string for someone who is not the sender or the receiver who doesn't have the key. For them, this looks like a random input block and some other random block. Okay, so they just look like two random blocks. Um, but of course, if you are the receiver, say Alice gets this thing, she can evaluate this FKR because R is sitting here. She has a key K already. She can evaluate FKR and recover M from uh, this by XORing with FKR again. Okay, so it's essentially an extension of what you would call a one-time pad to be not just one time now. We can keep using the, you know, kind of, well, the, this, this is, you use it only once. You change your R every time. Uh, but you can use the same key again and again. Okay. And Mac is even simpler to authenticate a message to get a signature or a tag for the message. All I do is I need to evaluate the random function, pseudo random function on the message. And that works as a tag. So, you know, I wouldn't have released this so if, if Alice gets a message and a tag which actually satisfies this, then she knows it must be Bob who must have released this. Nobody else could have figured out this string. It's a long string, you cannot just randomly guess it. So Bob must have actually released this thing into the wild. So he is endorsing the message by doing that. Okay. So that's, um, that's a Mac. Um, okay, so that's a PRF, very useful. It can let you do everything in symmetric cryptography you want to do. Uh, by the way, I should also mention, this kind of encryption scheme is by itself not strong enough. This resists what's called a CPA um, kind of attack, so chosen plain text attack. You also need to add a Mac uh, on top of this to make it secure against uh, CCA security, chosen cipher text security against chosen cipher text attack. So that reminds me of a joke I thought of. Please uh, uh, laugh, laugh, laugh at the end of this. Uh, but you need to know the current political situation in India. So we have two attacks, CPA, security and CPA, and security and CCA. Nowadays, we also need security and CAA. So it's a new kind of attack. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, if you don't know the context, it's fine. Um, OK, so that's a PRF. A block cipher is just a practical notion of a practical instantiation of a PRF. We know theoretical ways of building PRF some from much simpler objects called one-way functions or, you know, uh, yeah, essentially one-way functions. Uh, but in practice, that's not efficient enough. People just build a complicated function and assume that it's a PRF. The property here is simple enough and unstructured enough that people are comfortable assuming that this big function, you complicated function you created has a PRF property. So you would have heard of things like AES or DES. They're all block ciphers 
Um, and they are, you know, you're, you're happy to assume they are PRFs, okay? So block cipher is just a PRF, but actually it is for historical or legacy reasons, it has a few more features. In particular, it's a permutation, pseudo-random permutation. So it has, it's a one-to-one -one map. It, you know, it sends a block to a block and no two blocks are sent to the same block. Uh, and so once you fix a key, it's a permutation. So it's a bijection from set of blocks to set of blocks. And also it's invertible. So even, uh, so if you have the key, it's not just that you can evaluate in the forward direction, you can evaluate in the backward direction. And historically, you know, many constructions for encryption use this feature. But if you look at this one, to decrypt also you evaluate the PRF only in the forward direction. It's not a crucial feature uh, for a block cipher for its standard uses, uh, but you know, for legacy reasons, block cipher comes with this extra feature. And um, I didn't get into a whole other aspect of using block ciphers, which is, you know, there's one way of en encrypting and uh, creating a tag, MAC tag on a message, but that works only if this message is a single block. When the messages are longer, that are, you know, it doesn't work as immediately as this. And you can make it work. There are many ways to make it work. And these different ways of making it work are called the different modes of operation of a block cipher. So if you come across that term, that's all it means. Okay, so that is block ciphers. So, so I talked about, you know, symmetry key, encryption, um, digital signatures, hash function. I omitted public key encryption, which is another very important thing. I will um, have it feature in between, maybe maybe not in this talk. Uh, but you know, let me now move on to things which are somewhat non-standard, right? Things that you don't encounter during, uh, uh, you know, traditional cryptography course aimed at network security. Okay, so these are things that, uh, you know, the other speakers would get to in more detail later, but um, I'll try to give you a little sense of what it does. Okay, so proofs, why proofs? Because often we want to convince others of statements we are making, but they don't trust us. So if I just tell you something, you may not believe me. For instance, that Merkle tree hash, I might have told you, look, here is a hash that I obtained by hashing a message in which the sixth block was this value Z. You won't trust me. I have to give you a proof, right? So that's often the case. I'll need to uh, uh, give you proofs. Here's another maybe more blockchain-ish or Bitcoin-ish uh, uh, example. So I have some three uh, encryptions. They are, in, uh, they are encrypting some values, maybe the amount of money I have. And so uh, they are, the ciphertexts are A, B, and C. And I want to prove to you that the va and they are encrypting, I want to prove to you that they're encrypting values A, B, and C, little a, B, and C, such that A is equal to B plus C, okay? So maybe to prevent some sort of a double spending order, I'm splitting my wallet into two parts and I'm claiming that I didn't create new money, okay? Could imagine something like that. How do I prove this? Well, one way to prove this, I'll reveal how these encryptions were created. Just like in the case of hash functions, we had one option of revealing the entire input to the hash function, all the, all the blocks, in the case of encryption, all the, you know, the uh, key, if it's a public key, then it's a public key, but otherwise the secret key, the um, randomness used for encryption, and the messages. And you can locally evaluate it yourself, and hopefully there is some sort of a coercion resistance property, or it's called a commitment property. I couldn't have found out a uh, different explanation, right? That's one way if you, if, if I couldn't have found a different explanation, so be, I'm gonna assume that. Um, this is one way I could give you the proof. But this reveals too much. All I wanted to convince you was that A equals B plus C. I don't want you to know what A, B, and C are, okay? And that's where a zero knowledge proof comes in. I would like to convince you it has values, and you know, these are encrypting values A, B, and C, such that A equal to B plus C, but I won't, I don't want you to know what A, B, and C are, okay? All right, so that's what a zero knowledge proof's goal is, to convince you of things, some specific statements, but not reveal anything more. So it's the zero knowledge beyond the truth of the statement. 
I only want to convince you of the truth of the statement and nothing more. Okay. So very, um, I mean, now of course cryptographers take it for granted. It's the first thing we learn in a crypto course, and it's all you know demystified. But uh, you know, the first time you see this, it's a very counterintuitive thing, and this is one of the things that got uh, you know Goldwasser and Mikali their uh, Turing Award, and to come up with a kind of this kind of mind-bending notion of um, uh, the, even the possibility that you could give a proof without revealing anything more than this truth of the statement, uh, without revealing why the statement is true. Right? So it's a proof that doesn't, I mean, of course, many times you read a math proof, you feel like it's zero knowledge, you are convinced that the theorem is correct, you have no idea why it works, right? This is like a very formal way, you know, way of uh, doing that. Okay, so, I have some old slides sitting around giving, you know, kind of thing that uh, Professor Ponton was telling you about, uh, some animation about, um, you know, what is an knowledge proof is, trying to demystify it. It's, it's a very physical example, okay? So, uh, say there is some so soft drink, say Coke, um, and um, let's say Alice claims that, thanks to her superior taste buds, she can tell the difference between Coke that comes from a can or Coke that comes from a bottle. Because Bob doesn't, uh, so that's her claim, and they taste different. Uh, to Bob, you know, it, it all tastes the same. Uh, maybe Coke and Pepsi taste the same to him. Uh, so how can Alice now convince him that they are different? So here's a proof. It happens to be zero knowledge, but you know, in this case, there's no other way she couldn't have given her taste buds to him, right? Or maybe she could have had uh, him put some probes into her brain and check the uh, brain waves when she tastes the two things. But we don't want anything invasive like that. We want to give a zero knowledge proof. So here is a proof. Bob takes a cup and pours secretly um, some sample of the uh, soft drink, either from the can or the bottle. Okay? He, won't tell, um, he won't tell Alice where it came from. So he'll randomly choose to take from the can or from the bottle. And then he sends a sample over to Alice. She uses her superior taste buds, and she tells him whether it came from can or bottle. Okay, and if she's indeed telling the truth, she can do this. Okay, maybe Bob says, okay, she got lucky, you know, she's getting it right. He'll repeat it. He can repeat it a hundred times, and if she gets it right every time, all hundred times, then he's convinced that if the sample was the same, then you know, she, is, she has a half chance of getting it right and half chance of getting it wrong. And what is the chance that she got it right 100 times? It's one over two to the 100. We're willing to live with such improbabilities in life. So he will accept that she is indeed telling the truth. Okay? Or she was really, really lucky in some astronomical sense. So that's a zero knowledge proof. Why is it zero knowledge? Well, clearly, it's a, that's, uh, what I just now said is about that you know, Bob should be convinced. That's called the soundness of the proof. Okay? And Alice can convince him. That's the completeness of the proof. But it's also zero knowledge, in the sense that Bob didn't learn anything other than the fact that Alice's statement is true. Why? In, so intuitively, yeah, you know, he didn't see her taste it, so maybe he didn't. But here's a much more formal way of understanding that he didn't learn anything from this proof, because every time, immediately after he sends a question, he already knows what the answer is going to be before Alice tells him the answer. Right? He already knows the answer because he poured it from the can or the bottle. And you know, if Alice is indeed telling the truth, the answer will match what he is saying. Okay? So uh, an honest Alice is nothing to fear because every time she is going to answer, she knows that Bob already knew the answer. She is not leaking any new information. That's it or not. So, yeah, so uh, soundness by, is by repeating, and uh, zero knowledge is the fact that Bob already knew everything that he was going to see in this protocol. Uh, I, I, you know, you can that was too physical, and, uh, you know, um, you may not think it has any relevance to actual protocols, but it does. Uh, but I, I'll skip ahead. We'll see one more example of a zero knowledge proof uh, shortly. But before that, I want to tell you about a primitive which gets used in zero knowledge proofs called commitment. Okay. So, what is commitment? So, it's a 
again, a protocol between Alice and Bob. Okay. Um, and what Alice is doing is um, she commits to a value to Bob saying, look, I'm not, I don't want to tell you what this value is. It's like I write down this, um, you know, say my prediction for who is going to win the election or whatever. I write it in a sheet of paper. I don't want you to see it because you, know, you will um, make money out of it. I don't want you to do that, whatever. I don't want you to know what the message is. But I want to um, uh, you know, write it down, lock it in a box, and send the box to you for safekeeping so that you know that I indeed made this prediction today, you know, way before the elections. Um, so that's the first step of this uh, functionality. So Alice puts the message in a box, locks it, locks it, sends the box to Bob. He has no idea what's in the message. And then later, after the elections are over, maybe, I go ahead, Alice goes ahead and reveals this value. How? In this physical example, you could say she sends the key to the box. And Bob can open the box, take this sheet of paper out, read it. And at this point, he knows that Alice couldn't have magically changed the answer in the box by sending him some weird key. Right? So no matter what she sends, if it opens the box, what comes out of the box should be what Alice had put in before, uh, you know, during the commitment phase. Okay? So that's what we would like. We would like to have this kind of uh, uh, a digital analog of this physical game, this physical uh, um, commitment. And it's very easy to implement this in the random oracle model. Since we anyway are talking about random oracles, why not use it? Uh, so commitment looks like this in the random oracle model. To commit to a message, I take the message, pad it with some random string, long enough random string, and I hash the whole thing and send this to you. So let me tell you why. So that's my commitment. And when I want to later reveal, I will send you x and r. You can check h of x r indeed matches the value that I send you in the beginning. So why do I need, so why does it work? And why do I need to do all this to make it work? Um, so I cannot, as Alice, I cannot equivocate. Because to equivocate means I send you some commitment. And later, I can open it to two different values. Well, to be able to do that, I need to find a coalition in this hash function. Right, the x parts should be different. R can be anything, but the x parts should be different. So um, that's the the binding comes from the coalition resistance of this hash function, binding as in the commitment part. Why did I choose this R? Anyway, this H of X looks like something random. So maybe you'd think it's already hiding, right? Even if I send you this H of X, you can't make out what X is. Well, the trouble is that's only true if there is X itself is hard to guess. I don't want to make any assumptions as to what I'm committing to. Maybe I'm committing, you know, party A wins or party B wins in the election. It's very easy for you to try both of these things, H of party A and H of party B, and find out which one I committed to, right? So it's no good to just send H of X, where X is my message, because a message may not have enough randomness. So I put a random string along with it. So even if you guess, my, guess that my prediction is going to be party A, you have no chance in guessing this R correctly. R is long enough. Okay. So, so that's, that's commitment, and that's a protocol for commitment. Um, so let me use this quickly to give you another zero-knowledge proof. Uh, and Yuval just came in, so he'll, have you give, you know, he'll give you much, many more zero-knowledge proofs tomorrow. But uh, this is just a you know, warm-up. Uh, so what am I trying to prove to you, or what is Alice trying to prove to Bob? Alice has a graph, okay? And um, she knows a way to color the nodes of this graph using three colors, such that no edge has the same color on both ends. Okay? This is called the three coloring problem. She has a solution for the three coloring problem. Now given a graph, you know, as of now, we don't have, we don't think there is an efficient way to, given any arbitrary graph, even figure out if it's three colorable or not. Okay. If I could figure out, I could actually find a coloring, but we don't think there is a way for you to figure out uh, whether it's recolorable or not. Okay. So in particular, you don't know a coloring if it exists. Um, so if Alice just gives you the graph without the colors, you stare at it and you'd say, okay, you are claiming you, can, you have a solution for this, but how do I trust you? Well, one solution is I'll show him the coloring, but that's not zero knowledge. 
there should be a way for Alice to give this, um, convince Bob that there is a three coloring without revealing anything about the coloring or anything about, anything more about the graph than he already knew. So here's a little protocol, okay. Unfortunately, in my slide, uh, the, this is Alice, this is Bob. We'll, we'll stick to that. So this is Alice, this is Bob, this is Alice, this is Bob, right? Okay. Uh, so here is what um, uh, Alice does. Uh, so Alice already knows the, I mean, both of them know the graph. Alice knows the graph. And this is the coloring. Let's say, you know, I don't know if you can distinguish between the colors. There are three different colors. Uh, it's a valid coloring. First thing she does is she will commit um, to, okay, well, first thing she does, let's say, is she picks these colors and random, you know, randomly permutes them. So she's using three random colors. We know she'll use red, green, and blue. But, you know, red could be the first color here, blue could be the second color, or vice versa. Right? So she randomly assigns red, green, and blue to the three colors here, and uses that to get a coloring using red, green, and blue. And she would commit to this graph, meaning for every edge, she will put the name, write the name of the color in a box, in a slip of paper, put it in a box and send it. So Bob gets six boxes with colors written in them, but he has no idea what's in the box, right? So he has no idea if it's a valid coloring or not. Then he picks a random edge from the graph and challenges Alice, you know, with that edge. Okay, um, what's Alice supposed to do? What's the response to the challenge? She has to reveal the colors that were in the box for the endpoints of that edge. Okay, that's what she's supposed to do. Now, in, if indeed she had put in a valid coloring in the beginning, when she reveals these two colors, they will be different. Okay, so that's what Bob is going to check if they are distinct colors or not. And if they are distinct colors, he's happy. Of course, Alice might have just got lucky, right? Uh, maybe it was not a valid coloring. The edge that Bob picked happened to have distinct colors. So we will, um, you know, so Bob has some probability of catching Alice if she is cheating. If she is cheating means if it's not a valid coloring, if the original coloring was not valid, there is at least one edge where it's not valid. If every edge is valid, then it's a valid coloring. Right? So there's at least one edge where you'd find a conflict um, or, you know, there are no colors there or something. And Bob has a chance of at least, you know, one by number of edges for picking that as the challenge. And then Alice will be caught. She won't be able to explain in a way that keeps Bob happy. Uh, so you would repeat this many times. This, uh, this probability is not much. Like it's, you know, so 99% of the time Alice is winning in this thing. But we'll repeat this whole thing uh, 10,000 times. Okay, and, you know, what's the chance of her getting 10,000 heads, even if the chance of getting one head is 90% or 99%, right? It's, it's tiny. So you just repeat it enough number of times to make this astronomically small, the probability that Alice got lucky on every query. And that's, uh, that's our protocol. So I already kind of told you why it's sound, right? If Alice were cheating, she would have been caught in each iteration with a small probability. By the way, I should emphasize, each iteration, Alice is using a different random coloring, right? So underlying colors are the same, but it's a different coloring she's using each time. Otherwise, of course, I will you know, find the whole coloring by opening all the edges, one after the other. Um, okay, so that, that, so it's a sound protocol. Why is it zero knowledge? Well, what does Bob see? When he opens, the, uh, gets the commitment open, he's expecting to see just two different colors and though they are random colors, right? Because each time Alice is using a different random coloring, random recoloring of this graph, right? Or random assignment of three colors to the original three colors. So no matter what the edge Bob is picking, if it's the same as previous edges or not, he's going to get two fresh random, distinct random values. That's exactly what he is expecting and that's exactly what comes right? So he's not learning anything new. So that's why it's zero knowledge. So, and this pretty much a real proof, you know, this, this, this is a protocol. Uh, you had to worry about what kind of commitment it is and so forth. But if it's a random oracle world, you already have the entire description of zero knowledge proof. 
and why, and a proof that a zero knowledge proof is a valid zero knowledge proof. I hope that proof is not zero knowledge. Um, you know, you probably, hopefully, realize why it is a zero knowledge proof. All right, so, um, I'll, you know, you all will say many more things about zero knowledge proofs, I'm sure, but um, let me just say one more thing here. So this is a very interactive thing, right? Alice and Bob had to talk to each other. Um, in a blockchain like setting, that's not how it will get used. Um, so, okay, so this is the kind of interaction, right? Alice committed to all these colorings, and then um, Bob asked a random edge for her to reveal, and then she had to reveal it. And we had to repeat it many times, but maybe we could repeat it all in parallel in this case with random oracles. Um, and, um, you know, but it's still interactive. In a blockchain kind of setting, that's not what you have. Like somebody posted their proof, and you should be able to verify, ideally. Maybe you can implement protocols, but uh, you can implement protocols, but it's, if it's not interactive, uh, that is better. And indeed, non-interactive variants of zero knowledge proofs are possible. And since we have the random oracle sitting around, it's actually very, uh, in these kind of settings, it's very straightforward. Um, it's very straightforward once you know, I mean, it may not be apparent to you that it's uh, actually a valid proof. There's a, you know, an argument needed uh, exploiting the properties of the random oracle won't do that, but it should be intuitively clear what's going on. So in the protocol, you know, Alice, uh, after she commits the nodes, only after she commits the nodes would she get the challenge. If the challenge was already present, she could have, you know, created the uh, commitment in such a way that it satisfies this challenge, but not any other challenge, right? So it is important that this challenge came afterwards. It is also important that it's random, as in there is a good chance that, you know, uh, uh, any edge could be picked. Okay, say uniformly random over there. Now, to make this non-interactive, if somehow this challenge was already something that Alice could compute herself without going and asking Bob, then we don't, then this communication can be done kind of locally, right? And there's no computation, communication can be changed into a computation that Alice does. And that's exactly what we'll do. We'll say, okay, this qu query that is coming back, it's a random challenge. It's a random integer in some range. Let's make it the output of a hash function. Okay, so the first message, whatever it is, you hash it to get the second message. Let's see what that gives you. That means, first of all, Alice could have computed the second message herself without going to Bob. But also it means she couldn't have computed the second message. She couldn't have created the commitment to answer the second message. Right? Only after she creates a commitment would she be able to get this uh, hash. Because in the random oracle model, that's the only way you can evaluate a hash. You need the input, and then go to the oracle, get the output. So she couldn't have, so she can try this many times. She can try committing, you know, seeing if a challenge works or not, but still she cannot do it, you know, 10,000 times or whatever number of times. Um, she won't be able to, so this, again, single, uh, 10, there are 10,000 answers she needs to reveal. I think of it as she created all these 10,000 instances, committed to all of them, she got 10,000 uh, challenges as the output of the random oracle, okay? And she won't be able to come up with one uh, commitment here such that these 10,000 challenges coming out of the random oracle are all things she had already thought of as things she would satisfy, okay? okay so, you know, don't worry about formal proof now, but it can, it can be made formal. So the bottom line is that in the random oracle model, it's pretty easy to turn something like this into a non-interactive protocol. But I'm not giving all the references here, um, uh, but you know, I, I'll leave it to you all. Uh, since I didn't give any references for anything so far, I'll just keep going. Um, okay, so, uh, so yeah, so the non-interactive proofs looks like this. You send um, uh, two messages, M1 and M3, where M3 you computed as the answer the challenge h of m1, okay? And on this side, Bob will do that himself. He'll take m1, compute the challenge himself, and check if the answer, the uh, reveal 
satisfies those challenges. Okay, actually I have one more slide on zero knowledge, but I'm just like uh, naming things here. So there's something called SNARK. Uh, so it's um, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. So it's a mouthful. So I'll just mention what these various terms here mean. Uh, succinct means that the proofs are very short. Okay? Um, and they can be verified much faster um, than, the, than verifying the original, uh, the whole coloring. So that's not true for our previous proof, right? You have to verify a lot of edges, many more edges effectively than um, just checking the full coloring. So that is not succinct enough. But if you can make it succinct, that is a, uh, that, you know, to be a snark, you need the uh, uh, succinctness. Argument is the same as proof, you know. Um, yeah, it's a technical difference. Don't worry about it for now. Okay. Um, it's, it's an argument, you know, where I'll convince you. But uh, if I am, you are convinced only because you believe that I'm computationally bounded, I cannot, you know, find collisions and things like that. So, you know, proof, you are convinced, you know, regardless of my computational power. And it's not just a proof, it's a proof of knowledge or an argument of knowledge. So what does it mean um, to be an argument of knowledge or proof of knowledge? I'm not just proving to you that a statement is true, I'm proving to you that I know why it is true. In the case of coloring, for instance, I'm not just proving to you that there exists a three coloring, there's a, exists a way to color this graph with three colors, but that I know that color, such a coloring. Okay? So it's a different, you know, it's a stronger thing I'm trying to convince you of. Um, and it needs to be formalized, right? It seems like a very amorphous idea. How do you prove that you know it? Um, but we can do it. Um, There's a very convincing definition of what a proof of knowledge is. Um, I'll not get to it, do it right now. So that's what a snark is. And a ZK snark um, is a zero knowledge snark. Okay, so it's apart from being all this, it should also be a zero knowledge proof. Um, and to be, you know, just to give you a flavor of what could go into um, building something like that, um, since we already saw a Merkle tree and the proof using a Merkle tree, uh, here is one idea that kind of uh, works, but it needs, you need to know what a probabilistically checkable proof is. The probabilistically checkable proof is, um, uh, you know, a way to write down a proof of a statement that you can verify by checking very little of that written down proof. So if you have time to read the whole proof, you will not only be convinced, but you'll also probably learn why the proof is, uh, why the statement is true. So it's not zero knowledge, uh, and it's not short either, right? I mean, it's much longer than the actual witness. What you gain in a probabilistically checkable proof is it can be verified very quickly, okay? Um, it can be verified by not reading the entire proof. You can read just a few positions of the proof, and you'll be very convinced that the proof is correct. Um, okay, how can I uh, use this in the setting of something like a snark? I cannot send you something which is very long. That's the main issue. Well, I won't send you something very long. Instead, I will commit to this whole proof using this Merkle hash we saw earlier. And then suppose for, for now, imagine it's interactive. So you query now, with a few positions in the proof that you want to read. And I will open those positions using that Merkle tree proof we saw. So I'm claiming that, you know, so there's a long proof uh, that I committed to. You could check this proof by uh, reading a few random positions in the proof, which I don't know ahead of time, you decide after, you know, you decide randomly. Uh, so you tell me those positions you want to read from the proof and at that time, I open from my original Merkle tree these few positions, okay? So why was it important for me to commit? Because otherwise, if you, were, if you just told me these uh, challenges ahead of time, I can just give you an answer that will convince you. I know what will convince you. Uh, my challenge is to write down this proof ahead of time before you tell me where you're going to check, okay? And if I can do that, then you will be convinced. And we have the tools to do all this now. You, you know, I send you a short string. 
Um, that is my uh, uh, Merkle hash of the entire proof. Then instead of you sending me the challenges, I create the challenges using the random oracle, like I mentioned in the previous slide. And now I have the you know, challenges, I need to answer them, I will open the Merkle tree. So that's my entire proof, it has those three messages. I commit to the entire TCP, as it's called. Then I figure out what positions you would want to challenge me on using the random oracle, but I can do this only after creating the commitment. Um, and then I open that few positions using the Merkle tree proof, which is also much shorter than the full length of this proof. Right? So this is a way to get a succinct, non-interactive proof of some sort. And uh, you know, um, if you are in the random oracle model, this is a zero knowledge proof. It's, this is probably by itself not a proof of knowledge, um, but you know. You can, these things can be built using similar assumptions. Um, and uh, you don't need random oracles, you have other kind of assumptions that will make it work. Okay, so I'll leave it for others to tell you about it. Uh, but you know, using this PCP is uh, theoretically all right, but practically it's not all that efficient. And today people are actually using zero knowledge proofs in blockchains, they care about things being very fast. And there are other practical schemes like they're called Starks and Bulletproofs and so forth. Um, so somebody else will hopefully tell you something about it. Um, but for now, it suffices to know that such schemes exist. Uh, I have 13 minutes. So again, I'll show you a random assortment of a few things. They, uh, so we are done with zero knowledge proofs. Um, let me go back to signatures, right? So signatures is in some sense a proof. It's a proof that a message has been endorsed by somebody, somebody meaning the party who's holding the secret key corresponding to a public key. Uh, and the, so, so instead of soundness, we have some other notion, we have an unforgeability. And it's it all, unforgeability means somebody who doesn't have the key cannot create the signature. So it's kind of soundness, but it's also kind of zero knowledge in the sense that my signatures shouldn't leak my key, right? Then some, uh, then it won't be unforgeable. So signatures have some sort of a zero knowledge and soundness properties inherent in the unforgeability requirement. Um, a ring signature is, so here the statement you're proving is a very, simple statement that you know this party who is holding the secret key for this public key has endorsed a message. Ring signatures just makes it a little more complicated. It says, okay, I don't want to reveal that I am signing the message. I want to reveal, you know, so you want to sign a petition, you're keeping up the political theme. You know, you're, as an ICTS faculty member, you want to sign a petition. You want to say, oh, somebody in ICTS has signed this petition, but you don't want to stick your neck out and say it's me, right? So what you do is, in that case, a ring signature. You'd be claiming a statement, proving a statement that somebody among this set of people has signed this document, uh, and nobody will be able to trace it back to you. Okay, so that that'll be a great tool for, you know, democracy, I guess. Um, so without revealing who, you would be convincing everyone that somebody among this set of people has um, signed the message. So here is a little flavor of how you could do it. It's not a, a proper construction, but um, so recall our uh, signature, which was um, the way it was. The signature was to take invert the hash of the message, right? As the signature is f inverse of h of m, where f f inverse was our trapdoor pair, h was a random oracle. Now suppose for a second, let's say there are. Um, okay, so in the ring signature setting, there are many public keys out there. Let's say F1 to Fn. And you are holding one of them, something Fi in between. And you cannot create, and instead of creating, um, you know, Fi of S as, um, uh, sorry, instead of creating S as F inverse of H of M, well, so that you're checking this statement, Suppose the new statement that's going to be checked is this. H of M, the hash of message, is the XR of all these 
f, right, f, uh, f1 of s1 up to f1, fn of sn, where s1 to sn are some uh, strings that you give as a proof. So the signature is now s1 to sn together. The public key is f1 to fn together. And suppose this is how we are verifying the signature. You check h of m is equal to this, okay? Now, I have only one key. So if this is what you're going to check, can I actually um, you know, create the signature? And actually you can. So let's say you have the, uh, so the, say the k is the index of the key you have. So you have fk inverse. So for all the i not equal to k here, you just pick random strings, si. Okay, so you pick them first. And then you figure out what fk of sk should be to satisfy this condition, right? So fk of sk is h of m xor with fi of si xor together, all the i not equal to k. So you would like fk of sk to be this thing, but that's no problem. You can indeed invert that using your fk inverse and get an sk such that fk of sk is this thing. Okay, so you can create, you can indeed satisfy this condition. You'd hope that this by itself is also secure and um, not quite. Uh, you know, it turns out that now the adversary has a lot more freedom. They don't just have to give you a single inverse of, um, uh, you know, they, they can give you S1 to Sn, and that gives them more freedom. And it turns out actually this by itself is not secure, at least for very large N, but instead of doing this with XR, you do it with some other combining function, turns out you can make this secure. Um, but morally, you know, this is kind of what's going on. Um, and there are blockchain schemes out there which used to use at least uh, ring signatures. Okay. okay, so it's good to know about ring signatures. Uh, and um, I'll also put in uh, mention um, another kind of signatures called group signatures. Um, where to contrast it with ring signatures. So in ring signatures, there is no predetermined group. One fine morning you woke up and you th decided, I want to sign this petition as a member in ICTS. So we didn't make a, you know, in fact, my colleagues may not even be willing to be part of this whole, you know, petition signing thing. So I, how do I convince them to join this? Well, the point is they didn't have to join it. All they needed were these same public keys, F1 to Fn. So if they had these public keys for some other purpose, I could kind of misappropriate it and use that to create this signature. In contrast, group signatures, there is a predetermined group. And further, to make things trickier, there's also a group manager and who can trace the actual signer. So this is for a more kind of, uh, a trusted kind of setting. You, if you have a trustworthy group manager, you could use a group signature. But there also the guarantee is that looking at the signature, you don't know who the actual signer is, except the group manager figures out. And you can take this kind of even further. Um, you know, there are things, you can extend the ring signatures to other things like something called mesh signature, something called attribute-based signature, where essentially the statement you're proving gets more and more complicated. And you, and there are versions of whether you need a group manager or not, um, and what kind of assumptions you use. But you know, just to give you a sense of, these are not zero knowledge proofs per se, but they very much have a flavor of proving various claims about the fact that I know the secret key corresponding to this, and I am endorsing this message. So you're claiming um, some property, right? I am a part of, uh, part of the set, or I have enough attributes uh, to satisfy some property, and along with that, you're endorsing a message. Um, okay, another thing that actually is getting used in blockchains nowadays, something called a verifiable random function. So we already saw what a PRF is, what a pseudo random function is. Uh, a VRF has an additional verifiability feature. Okay, so PRF was this thing that, and if Alice picks a random key and Bob keeps querying her on FKX, he can't tell if Alice is sending actually FKX with the same key K, or she is just making up random strings and answering. Okay, 
But this actually is a problem sometimes, right? What if Alice is actually sending random values? There is no way in the world for Bob to know that Alice is doing the right thing. So in settings like authenticated communication, where you and I are talking, it's in our, in both our interests to do the you know, honest thing. We are just protecting ourselves against the outside world. Yeah, you can trust the person evaluate, holding the PRF key to actually be doing the right thing. But in a, other settings where maybe you're using this PRF to select a leader, something like that, right? So, or a committee. People claim saying, oh, my PRF key evaluated to, you know, on this input evaluates to that value, but it may be a value they just picked up, or it could be a random value they picked up. So how do you verify this? So in a VRF, along with your public, private key for the PRF, there's a public version of it that you'll publish ahead of time. And then whenever you prove or you send out FKX, you, you can also attach a proof saying that, look, this value that I'm sending is indeed FKX, where K is the private key associated with the public key. The other person only knows public key and X and uh, you know, this value you're sending out, they don't know the actual private key. Um, so that's what a PRF, VRF is. It's a very specialized statement, so you don't need a full-fledged zero-knowledge proof. You can build you know, this VRF uh, more efficiently than you would build a zero-knowledge proof system generically. Um, okay, so it's actually getting used in um, uh, Algorand, which is one of the, uh, probably the only name I mentioned so far, um, uh, for you know, selecting committees, something they call sortition. It's apparently an English word. Um, e so each party has a secret key there, but they have to publish the you know public uh, PK also for it. And the you know the VRF is used to evaluate, kind of do a lottery, right? So you use some public information, evaluate your private uh, VRF on that public information. And if the value comes out, the, if the value that comes out has some property, then you are you have won the lottery or otherwise you're not. Um, and, um, you know, so that's how they use it, right? It's kind of to implement a lottery system. So it's important, uh, that nobody else knows the output of, you know, whether you are going to get selected or not until you come out and say, I got selected. That's why it's not some very, uh, sta you know, like a, not a random oracle. It's some, it's a uh, function for which you have a private key. Um, so it's not revealed until you disclose it. And when you do disclose it, you will also have to give a proof that you have disclosed the value correctly. Okay, so two minutes. Uh, um, I'll mention one more primitive, which I've, you know sounds like something you could use in a blockchain kind of setting. Not seen any reference to it, but I thought I'll throw it out here. Um, so zero knowledge sets. It's a um, it's a zero knowledge proof, in a, or it's a primitive which uh, has a flavor of commitment and zero knowledge proves, so let me tell you what it is. So it lets me commit to sets of values, okay? So set is, say, bit strings of certain length. Uh, so I can take a, you know, arbitrarily large set of such strings, create a commitment of a fixed size, and later, I can prove in zero knowledge, to, you know, so, so I can claim that, oh, this string X was indeed in the set S. And this much you could actually already do using Merkle trees. That's what I said you can do in Merkle trees. Uh, think of all those blocks as the elements in your set. But here you can also prove non-membership. I can prove that, oh, this X is not in the set I've committed to. Okay, that's something you, not, not immediate from Merkle trees. And further, I want to do all this without ever revealing the size of the set. So in a Merkle tree proof, you know, there's a certain height and that gives you an indication of how many things you are, uh, you know, how many leaves there are, right? Um, I don't want to do that kind of thing. Okay. So it turns out, still, you can use Merkle trees. It's just that you need to be more careful about the hash function you use. And if you use some hash functions which are also 
what are called mercurial commitments, then there is a way to do it. Um, and I'll skip what exactly it is. Uh, sorry. Uh, and I'll just mention that there is a, another variant of zero knowledge sets called statistically hiding sets, which is also something with a similar flavor. Uh, it's, um, but it's, we know it based only on stronger computational assumptions. It has some better guarantees in terms of information theory hiding, but it relies on stronger assumptions. Okay, so since MPC is something that Kermit would be talking about um, soon, I'll leave it to her, I'll skip this. Actually, that's all I have. Uh, do I, do you want me to like take a couple of extra minutes or, I mean, there's something she would need to talk yeah, about. So Okay, so this this time goes into her account. <laughs> uh, so second multi-party computation, which cryptographers for some reason abbreviate as MPC, uh, and others abbreviate as SMC with secure. Uh, you know, so we don't want to commit to security. Yes. Um, what does it let you do? It's a very general framework for mutually distrusting parties to collaborate without revealing their private data. Collaborate means they want to do some computation on their collective data. Um, say, you know, you have a, uh, you are Google, uh, or you are Google user, you have a query, Google has their database. You want to query Google, today you would send your query to Google. But what if you don't want to reveal your query to Google? Well, one uh, impractical but, uh, you know, potential solution would be for Google to send you the entire database so that you can do it search locally. But of course, Google doesn't want to do that. It's not just practical, they, you know, it's, it's their private data. Just like your query is your private data, their database is their private data. So is there a way for me to query this database without me having to reveal my query and them having to reveal, or them having to reveal their entire database? It would seem impossible, but there is a way and that's called um, secure multi-party computation. You can do things like you can have an auction, without a trusted auctioneer. Um, and most cryptographic tasks can be seen as special case of MPC with specialized features on top of it, right? Um, in the context of blockchain, I would mention one thing, uh, an interesting use for the other way. So clearly, you know, this is some tool you could use in many settings, including blockchains. Um, you just need to figure out kind of most efficient ways of doing that. Um, in the reverse direction also there is an application. So if you all believe in blockchains and have them out there, you can use that to enhance the security guarantees from MPC a little bit. Um, in particular, in MPC an issue is that, say there are only two parties talking to each other um, and both of us are getting outputs from this computation. Maybe, you know, after I get my output, I will abort the protocol and leave you hanging and you won't get your output. Okay, so that's called fairness. If you have blockchains and some cryptocurrency to go with it, you can implement fines for aborting a protocol. Okay, so that'll be an incentive for me not to, uh, and after I get my output, I would rather let you also get the output because otherwise I'll get fined. Okay, so uh, that's all and tomorrow again, I'll give kind of an introductory lecture where I'll just continue with this showing more of MPC and other notions of computing on encrypted data. Uh, but meanwhile, you might see much more advanced notions of MPC and, uh, uh, you know, uh, computing on encrypted data. But uh, I'll, I'll continue with this next time. Okay. Good. So next.